Hey guys, welcome back to the Voice of Diabetes. This is Diana Bitucci. Before we get started with today's topic, you guys all had a wonderful Christmas. Uh, for me personally, this year was very different. I was planning to have a big gathering as it is our first year in the new house. However, due to COVID-19, we had a very small, small gathering um, just to protect ourselves, to protect our families and everyone else around us. I hope you guys still managed to have a good time even with the smaller gatherings this year. On that note, I would like to get straight to talking about prediabetes as it does affect one in three Americans in the United States. Over 84% of those people don't know they have it and untreated prediabetes, over 50% of those people develop full-blown diabetes, if not more. Um, so it is an important topic because we want to make sure that we are uh, screening the people that could have it so that we can take interventions quicker. Some of the risk factors of prediabetes are we have being overweight, um, which, you know, being overweight means a BMI of 25 to 29.9 is considered to be overweight and then over 30 is considered to be obese. So I did add a calculator, uh, a link to a calculator that calculates BMI. So please be sure to click on that. And all you have to do is put in your weight, put in your height and you hit calculate and your BMI comes up. And if you are you know, overweight or obese, then we will discuss that. But obviously the only way to really uh, um, reduce that risk is by losing weight, which I will talk extensively throughout this YouTube channel. Another risk factor is being over 45 or older, um, having a, a family member such as a parent or a sibling who has type 2 diabetes. Inactivity is also huge. Um, having gestational diabetes, meaning you had diabetes during pregnancy or you delivered a baby that is 9 pounds or greater. Having PCOS, uh, also known as polycystic ovarian syndrome. And then race and ethnicity also puts you at higher risk, such as African American, Hispanic, Latino American, uh, American Indian, Pacific Islanders, and some Asian Americans are also at higher risk. So you're probably wondering, well, Diana, how do I get tested for this? How do I find out if I have prediabetes? Which is a very valid question because there are tests, and the only way to find out if you are a prediabetic really is by going to the doctors regularly, which I recommend. All of you get a yearly physical, uh, even if you're feeling perfectly fine, you should always see your primary care provider at least once a year, if not more. If they recommend that you're seen more often, obviously you follow your doctor's recommendations. So when a patient comes into my office, if I'm screening for prediabetes, normally what, what I do is I order a simple uh, task called hemoglobin A1C. In our office, fortunately, we have the A1C machine right in the office. We do a quick figure stick, we put it through the machine in six minutes, we find out what the number is. If the number is below 5.7, the patient does not have prediabetes. If the number is 5.7 to 6.4, then we consider that patient a prediabetic. So please be sure that you can ask if you meet those risk factors and you want to know if you have prediabetes, you can ask your, your regular doctor to, to put this test on the next blood work you, you have done. Another test that I often order, it is very easy. I do a fasting glucose. So what I tell patients is here's a lap slip. Make sure you don't eat after midnight the day before you get the blood work done. In the morning, you go in, you get the blood work and we look at the level. If the level is less than 99, so the fasting glucose, if it's less than 99, you're not a pre-diabetic. If it's 100 to 125, you are a pre-diabetic. So that's another simple way to us, for us to find out but you have to make sure that you are seeing your doctors regularly. I always tell patients it's better to find out if you have something sooner because we can intervene and we can prevent from something bad happening, such as developing diabetes in the long run. A lot of those risk factors that I mentioned were non-modifiable, meaning you can't change it. You can't change your age, you can't change your race or ethnicity, but you can change how active you are being. So if you are completely inactive, I tell patients, start slow. Right now, the American Heart Association, they recommend 30 minutes, five day a week of moderate intensity exercise. That means brisk walking, playing tennis, 
However, if you are that person listening in today and you are not doing anything for exercise, which unfortunately a lot of us in the United States are not active, I tell patients start slow. 10 minute walk, perfect. If that's 10 minutes of walking that you were not doing before, that's a great start. And then as you build endurance, you can increase the intensity and you can increase the duration. 10 minutes for a week, next week can be 15 minutes, starting slow. 20 minutes and then gradually increasing to where you are exercising 30 minutes, five days a week. Don't focus on just the weight. I am not worried or concerned just about a patient's weight, more so what I'm concerned about their internal health, blood pressure, uh, blood glucose levels, uh, cholesterol levels. I'm gonna talk about all of those in detail in, in a different video. However, for now, I just wanna really tell patients, make sure you, you're checking to see if you're pre-diabetic Make sure you're staying more active. Anything more than what you're doing now is very great. It's a great start. So I encourage you guys to do something more than you're doing now. And if you are, obviously diet is huge. If you are adding too much of unnecessary sugars, sodas, orange juices, apple juices, any type of juice, naturally they are very saturated with sugar. They have a lot of added sugar that you don't need. So I tell patients start slow. You can start by substituting half of it with water. So if you're drinking juice, add 50% water and gradually keep reducing the amount of juice there is and more water until you eliminate all of that juice content. If you are a soda drinker, and we know sodas are not good for your health, but they're especially not good for blood sugars because there's a lot of sugars in sodas. I normally tell patients start to substitute it with a salsa water. If you really crave that carbonation, that's usually a good way to do it and just slowly adding more water, more salsa waters, and eliminating the soda. So those are really, really great ways to get started. And I hope I encourage all of you guys to do the same. Um, starting slow is key because we tend to maintain good habits when we're starting slow and we're making it part of a lifestyle. I don't like to call it a diet. I like to say lifestyle because we are more we are more likely to maintain a healthy lifestyle than we are with just calling it by diets or different things like that. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Like, comment, share with your friends, share with your families. So please tune in next week. We are gonna be talking about COVID-19 vaccine and diabetes. I will talk about both Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. I'm really excited to share all the information with you and I will give you my opinion if you should get it or not. So make sure you tune in. And I wanna wish you guys all a very happy new year. Uh, please remember to stay safe, to social distance, to wear your masks, hand washing. Those are very, very good preventative measures. And hope, I'm hoping for a very good 2021 where we can all remain safe and healthy. I'll see you guys all next week. Stay tuned. Take care.